Director of the Norwich Public Library. And as you know, regulars know that the Library and the Historical Society um, co-host First Wednesdays, which is a program of the Vermont Humanities Council. I was just mentioning to Christopher, who is the new ED of the Humanities Council, I'm going to introduce him in a second, that every month I sit back there and I take pictures of the backs of your heads. <laughs> and that's not exciting. It doesn't look great. So I, I have people's permission. I would very much like to take a picture from up here of all of you here. And you'll all be so far away, no one will know who's who, and I promise I won't blow it up. But if that's okay with everyone, I would like to do that, because I think it would be great to see a big crowd, finally, and not just the backs of people's heads. So.
Philosophy and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College. He's the 2019 winner of the Templeton Prize. You probably know a fair amount about what that is, but if you don't, he's joining an eminent roster of 48 past awardees, including Mother Teresa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the 14th Dalai Lama, and another Upper Valley icon, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, established in 1972 by the late investor and philanthropist Sir John Templeton, the prize serves as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries relating to the deepest and most perplexing questions facing humankind. Heather Templeton Dill, the president of the, Dill, of the Templeton Foundation, states, Professor Kaiser embodies the values that inspired my grandfather to establish the Templeton Prize and to create the John Templeton Foundation. Two values which were especially important for him are the pursuit of joy in all aspects of life and the profound human experience of awe. A native of Brazil, he obtained his PhD from King's College in London and received the 1994 Presidential Faculty Fellows Award from the White House. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and his books on science, philosophy, and religion have been published in 15 languages including The Island of Knowledge, The Limits of Science and the Search for Meaning, a, te a Tear at the Edge of Creation, and The Simple Beauty of the Unexpected. He has published hundreds of peer-reviewed articles, essays, and op-eds, and frequently participates in TV documentaries and radio shows in the US and abroad. He is the co-founder of the NPR blog on science and culture, 13.7, and he also directs the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth College. We are deeply proud to have him here with you tonight, and please welcome Professor Fletcher. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It was a visionary move from your team, I have to say. Congratulations to them. Um, and it is, I think this is actually the first talk that I give after the announcement of the prize. It makes me very happy to be doing this locally. And I see a lot of friendly faces. And, and even my old yoga teacher is here. So maybe we can do some, you know, some, some asanas here later on. But tonight I've been asked to talk a little bit about science and our place in the world. And I'll do that using this talk, which is really about what is truth and how do we know uh, if we are on the right path to discovering what is truth. And furthermore, how do we know there is a final answer to knowing what is true and what is not true? Okay. Now, I'm going to do this within the perspective of science because that's sort of, and philosophy, because these are the two realms that I deal with. But the questions that I'm going to ask, they sort of pervade humanity. You know, in a sense, um, if there is one thing that we share in common with our ancestors, is the curiosity to know who we are, right? So there is something which is very exhilarating and very perplexing about being human, right? Because after all, being human, we are capable of feeling joy and being excited about things and being creative and having friends and love and all that. On the other hand, there is this perplexity that the fact that we can um, imagine the, in the infinite, we can contemplate the divine, we can talk about abstract notions, sort of like a god could. On the other hand, we're animals, right? And because we're animals, we are constrained to our bodies, we are constrained to a finite time in this planet, and we all know that this time is finite. So the presence of the end of life is something that is always in our minds, even if we don't want to think about it or if we push it under the carpet, there is this sort of strange tension between contemplating, you know, the infinite, the eternal, and knowing that we're here, this is what's going on right now, maybe there is something else afterwards, but we're not sure, right? So you can bet on it, like Pascal, you know, Pascal's bet, I don't know if you know about this, Pascal's wager, so Blaise Pascal from the early um, 17th century would say, 
you know, even if you don't believe in God, it's not a bad idea to kind of say you do because after all, you know, if you die and there is a hell and there is a heaven, you'd much rather go to, hell, to heaven than to hell. So, you know, it's like, I'm not sure, but, right? And the point is that how do you f put science into this very complex existential search that we have, right? Did I break something? It looks like it, it just... Okay. Well, that shows that gravity is universal. It works. <laughs> it always works. It never rests, you know. Sorry about that. Um, it doesn't look like it broke. It just split apart. So, so the point is, how can science participate in this conversation? Right? And that's what we, we will talk about uh, today. So let me start by quoting from the master. So Albert Einstein, okay? So what did he say? He said, what I see in nature is a magnificent structure that we can comprehend only very imperfectly and that must fill a thinking person with a feeling of humility. Okay. Now that's quite something coming from one of the greatest minds ever because he spent his life trying to make sense of the world, believing very deeply that human reason was able to decipher the mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of matter, the mysteries of light. And uh, since we are made of matter, we need light. He was, in a sense, connecting what he was trying to figure out about the world to the way we live, to the way we perceive reality. So, but he, on the other hand, he was humble enough to acknowledge the fact that the world is very complicated, right? And there's a lot of stuff out there that we do not know. And so even if I'm a great mind and I'm developing these amazing ideas about the universe, the knowledge that I have of reality is always going to be incomplete and imperfect. So some of what I've done over the last few years is refine these ideas, you know, and, and so go a little deeper in what does it really mean for you not to know what the world is made of and what does it tell us about our search for knowledge and our search for meaning, okay? Now, there is another quote from him that I love, which I think is very important to put here, which is the following, the fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. He who does not know it and can no longer wonder is as good as dead. And then he goes on and says, like a snuffed out candle. Now this is really interesting because, first of all, he is putting the notion of the mysterious out there. Okay, What is the mysterious? Well, let's think about it. You guys can see me and you can hear me. And you can, you're sitting down and you know, you, there is warmth in the room, so you have your senses, right? Your five senses. And using those five senses, what's going on? Your eyes, everything is capturing this information about where you are and the moment, and your brain is integrating all this sensorial information and creating a sense of reality. This is happening now. And you say, this is the world, this is reality, this is where things are. Now, it turns out that this that we are seeing and hearing right now is a very, very tiny slice of what's really going on around us. There is a lot of stuff that is going on around us that we have no clue about because we can't see it, we can't hear it, you can't taste it, or you can't touch it. Let me give you a few examples. Right now, you're all glowing in the infrared. If I had eyes that could see not just from red to violet, but if I had infrared goggles, what I would see is this beautiful display of people shining, you know, because you're all more or less at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and a body at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit uh, radiates in the infrared. So you're glowing, but I don't see that, okay? <laughs> or you don't see, which is kind of a shame. It'd be nice, right? <laughs> Another one, all the AM and FM radio stations around here, they are beaming those electromagnetic waves across space. Well, this room is filled with them. 
Okay, but we don't see that because those waves are very long wavelengths, and our eyes only see very short wavelength kind of light waves. Okay, so but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's kind of like what the fox told the little prince, right? He says that what is essential is invisible to the eye. So in a sense, science is the way you grasp, you go beyond the immediate, you go beyond what you can perceive, and you amplify, you expand your vision of reality in such a way that the more you look out into the world with our instruments, and I'll talk more about that later on, the better sense of what is reality you construct. And of course, as you look at the history of science, you know, like for example, uh, before Galileo had his telescope in 1609, people only did astronomy with the naked eye. Okay, so you would go out there and you'd kind of see the stars a little bit and you see some of the planets. You wouldn't see Uranus, you wouldn't see Neptune because you can't see them with the naked eye. So you had a vision of reality based on what you could see of the sky. And then a fellow called uh, Van Lieperhey in, in, in the Netherlands invented the telescope in 1608. Galileo gets uh, one of them from a friend of his who was a diplomat. He builds a much better one. He grinds his own lenses. He has this insight of let's see what's going on up there in the sky. So he points the telescope to the sky and he is amazed because what he sees is completely different from what you see with the naked eye. And you can all do the same experiment that Galileo did with a pair of binoculars. Because our binoculars nowadays are, uh, nowadays are as good as, as what Galileo had in 1609. So basically what you're going to see, if you point to the Milky Way, you're going to see a bunch of stars. You're not going to see clouds. So he figured out that the Milky Way was made of stars. He figured out that the moon is not a perfect sphere, but is full of craters and mountains. So it's very imperfect, which was very much against the prevalent notion at the time, which was that the moon was made of a fifth essence. You know, this was Aristotle speaking, and hence it was perfect and eternal, etc. He said, the moon looks just like the earth, just whitish, you know, kind of like with mountains and holes and, and stuff like that. So he saw, he thought that Saturn had ears because he couldn't resolve the rings, but, you know, it wasn't a perfect sphere. And he found that Jupiter had four moons because those were the biggest four moons of Jupiter. Now we know Jupiter has more than 70 moons. The number keeps growing. Can you imagine in the night? That must be spectacular, right? So, but he could see four of them. So basically with the new instrument, he changed the way we looked at, at the universe because one of the consequences of his findings was that if Jupiter has, they, he called it satellites, you know, going around it just like the Earth does, why should the Earth be a planet, uh, should, should be the center of everything? It could just be like what Copernicus had told about 150, about 60 years before Galileo, that maybe the sun is the center and the Earth was just a planet. So a new instrument completely changed the way we looked at the universe. We looked at the cosmos. We looked at our place in the cosmos because before Earth was the center, we were created in God's image. I shouldn't be saying this here very, you know, I should. <laughs> Um, uh, gotta be, I'm going to be hit by lightning or something. But the point being that with the displacement of the Earth from the center, right, to the periphery as another planet, he takes the centrality of humanity away, right? And he creates a very serious problem, which is this. As science advances more and more, and this is still true today, and you may even identify with this a little bit, the way things seem to be going is that the more you know about the universe, about the world, about life, the less important we become. Science seems to be displacing humanity to just be this undignified thing, you know, at the bottom, you know, like completely not important in the big scheme of things. Because Earth was the center, it was displaced, the sun became the center, but then of course, a few hundred years after Galileo, it was very clear that the sun was not the center. The sun was just a star. And like the sun, our Milky Way galaxy has about 200 billion stars, okay? Now we even know that most of those stars have planets too. 
So just think about this, right? Just in our, star, our Milky Way galaxy, and I'll show some pictures in a second, there are trillions of planets, trillions, okay? So a one with 12 zeros. That's a lot, and the moons, right? Jupiter is a planet, it has 70 moons, so you can imagine the incredible diversity of these worlds. And we are in one world, in this vastness, and the universe is huge, and our galaxy is not even the only galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of other galaxies out there, and the universe is expanding. I mean, it never ends. And then, of course, we found out that the stuff that fills up the universe, the matter and stuff that fills up the universe, only makes up uh, the, our stuff, meaning our matter, you know, the atoms, you know, from the periodic table, from hydrogen all the way to uranium, that's only 5% of what's out there. So now even the stuff we are made of is that important. It's actually just 5%, right? So it's very undignifying, apparently, to be, to be, uh, to be a human in these, in these days. And of course, um, that is the message that people have, in, in a sense, saying that, in a, in a metaphorical way, science killed God and offered nothing in return, just numbers and data. What happened to the spiritual value of humanity and its place in the cosmos? How can we deal with this, right? So that is the question, right? And of course, then you have the new atheists, like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens uh, and Dan Dennett, you know, writing books with titles like God Delusion, you know. So the radical new atheism basically denies completely the existence of any deity, and we can have this conversation later if you want, but doesn't really offer anything else in return. And we humans, I believe, are very spiritual people. We need some level of transcendence, some way of kind of lifting ourselves up from just the animal part, you know? And it could be through friendship, but it could be also by looking at the universe, looking at the world, and realizing that we are part of some, something which is much grander than we are, right? And that's where you start to find some spiritual dimension in the sciences, because obviously, as I mentioned before, right, when we look around us, we are surrounded by what we don't know, the invisible of San Zupehi, right, of the little prince and the fox. It's really the invisible that is the commitment of science. It's figuring out what's beyond what we can see. So science, as I like to say, is a flirt with the unknown. It's really about dealing or trying to create, construct a narrative that expands our view of reality in such a way that it's always about the unknown, approaching the unknown, learning about the unknown, and of course, as this picture shows, and I love this picture, it's kind of a sad picture, obviously, right? Because the fish is stuck in there, you know, in the fish bowl, there's this huge ocean in front of it, and it cannot go out. So it knows it's there. So you can, you know, assuming it's a smart fish, right? It kind of, and now people say fish, is, fish are intelligent, which is interesting. So it knows there is more to reality than what's in his little fishbowl, but it can always see kind of, you know, through this foggy glass, right? And that's, in a sense, a metaphor to the human condition, you know? We know there is more out there, and we are trying to find this more and more and more, but, right, it's through a foggy glass. Um, wait, I think I went the wrong way. I did. So, so what do we do? Well, there's this other fellow, Werner Heisenberg, right? So he was one of the architects of quantum physics. So if you don't remember what quantum physics is, it's the part of physics that studies the world of the very small. So the world of atoms and molecules and even smaller things than atoms like subatomic particles like protons and even smaller than protons, things like quarks. So it's basically trying to find the smallest constituents of matter and figure things out. I mean, what is the world made of, okay? Um, and he said this, which is quite kind of amazing, right? Because 
a lot of scientists out there have this view of science as detached from us, in a sense that scientific truth is independent of how we ask the questions about nature. So when they say, I know how things fall, like the law of gravity, right? Um, and there is a mathematical formula that will describe you how fast things fall due to the attraction of gravity here on the surface of the Earth. That is because we're asking this question in this planet right now because we feel gravity and we want to understand it. So there is something very human about the kinds of questions we ask, and there is something very limiting about the kinds of questions we ask because there are only so many questions you can ask about things because, you know, again, we are limited in what we know. So what he says is, no, we don't observe nature, okay? But we observe nature within the questions we can ask about nature. So when I talk about light is an electromagnetic wave and we can see from red to, to purple, uh, violet, and, but there's all this other stuff, I can say these things because people have asked questions about the different kinds of electromagnetic waves, light waves that exist, study them, and came up with an answer, right? And other kinds of intelligent creatures that may or not exist in the universe may be exposed to a very different kind of physical reality. And they're going to ask very different questions than we ask, right? Because we evolved in a very specific planet under a very specific set of circumstances. And I'll talk about that later. Um, and then there's this brilliant French philosopher uh, from the 17th century called Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle. So Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle in 1686, he wrote a book which is basically called A Conversation on the Plurality of Worlds. 1686, the same year that Newton published his famous book, The Principia, you know, with the laws of motion and gravity and stuff, this French fellow was thinking there are other planets out there, other worlds, there are other life forms. What kind of a life forms could there be, you know? And the wonderful thing about this book, and I really, really suggest you read it because it's written as a dialogue between the philosopher and a marquise. So a noble woman was a protagonist, which at the time was unheard of to have. And, and she would trip the philosopher with her questions all the time. So at some point, she was like, but why you guys do this? You know, why do you want to be a philosopher? And his answer was this, that all philosophy is based on two things, curiosity and poor eyesight. <laughs> and it's just perfect, right? Because that's exactly right. So philosophy and slash science is exactly that. It's motivated by this curiosity, this flirt with the unknown. But on the other hand, you know, we are myopic. We can only see so much of what's out there. Right? And we want to know more and more and more. And that's the whole cycle of things. All right. So, um, did I talk about this? Okay, so have you seen the movie The Matrix? Good. <laughs> it's funny because I'm teaching a course now at Dartmouth, which is called the Physics for Poets class. So it's mostly, you know, for humanists. And uh, I asked the class two, two days ago, I said, have you watched The Matrix? And they looked at me <laughs> like about half of the class had never heard of it. And I realized, damn, it's a known movie, you know? <laughs> so of course they don't know The Matrix, right? I mean, that's, I say, okay, so I explained to them what The Matrix is. And the reason I, I, I bring in The Matrix is because you may have heard of, of Plato's cave. So Plato's allegory of the cave, it's, it's, it's brilliant insight. So it's from his volume seven of the Republic. And Plato, so about 400 BCE, he wrote these books as, in particular the Republic, was a training manual for the future leaders, okay? He would call them the philosopher kings. So his idea was that a true leader should be enlightened in the ways of philosophy, in the ways of military strategy, being a good athlete. So th there was a whole recipe, you know, music and art. And so the Republic, at least this part of the Republic, was es essentially 
how do we create the best possible leaders of the future, right? And, and one of the things is that he's doing is that he wants to convince people through his uh, dialogue, so his conversation, that the way we look at the world is fake. That what we see of reality is not the real thing. That if you really want to get to the truth, you should not trust the way you see things, the way you perceive real, the world, right? So he creates this allegory of the cave that goes more or less like this. If you imagine for a second, okay, and this is not me, that's him writing, so don't be offended. Imagine they are all slaves and you were born chained in such a way and you grew up chained in such a way that you can only look forward. You don't look to the sides, you don't look back. All you can do is look forward. And all you can see is this cave wall. And on the cave wall, there are these shadows which are projected on it, okay? And so to you, that is reality. All you see of the world is whatever is showing up on the cave wall, okay? Those shadows dancing on the cave wall. And Plato's argument is that is us if we trust our senses to look at the world. Because if you could look back, so if you didn't have your chains, so if you could look back, what you'd see is that behind you all, there's this big roaring fire, and there are some people with little puppets. And the fire is projecting the shadows on the wall and making this whole animation thing, right? It's like an old-fashioned 400 BCE movie, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and the point is that what we see of the world is incomplete because we don't have the full vision of what's going on. So that was his allegory of the cave. And it goes on to a more complex level that we don't dis need to discuss, which is what happens if you unchain one of the slaves and shows him or her what's really going on, you know, would that person want to see or not want to see, and seeing men seeing the truth, and et cetera. But, so here is the idea. So if you see the matrix, here is the point. So here are the slaves. This is what is being projected on the wall that, I don't know, looks maybe like a unicorn doing something. Um, and here is the naughty guy with the projection of the, you know, playing like with his fingers to project stuff on the wall. And there is Neo, and the, the slaves, you know, one of them says, you know, it is prophesied that one day a chosen one among us will break free of this world and reveal to us the true nature of reality. And Neo, Keanu Reeves here, says, very unlikely, meaning, can we even make sense of what the true nature of reality means, right? That is the question. And the answer is only in part, right? And that's what we've been doing all along. And I don't think I'll have time to talk about all these different aspects of things. Actually, um, are we going to have questions? Where is the supreme leader? <laughs> are we? Okay, and how long do we have all together? Six hours? <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah, I'll go for a while, and not a very long while, and then we can ask, you know, you can ask questions, because to me that's the fun part. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, these are just illustrations of, of different ways in which you can think about reality. And so let's start with what I just mentioned to you, which is this notion that we use instruments to amplify the view of the world, right? our view of the world, right? And they are amazing nowadays, right? So if you're interested in science, or if you're an engineer, you have seen things like those giant arrays of radio telescopes that receive information from exploding stars billions of light years away from us, right? Or You've seen something like this. This is actually the heart of a detector at CERN. So CERN is this uh, is European laboratory for particle physics, for discovering the ultimate tiny little blocks of matter, okay? And this is the core of a detector called ATLAS. It is the biggest machine ever made in the history of civilization, okay? Because 
He has four detectors. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the person. So it's a six-story high. It's bigger than this church. So just to give you an idea. And, um, and it runs for about 27 kilometers underground. So it goes from France to Switzerland. It's around Geneva. And basically what it does is it's a very sophisticated, very powerful microscope that is trying to see the tiniest little bits of stuff that exist, right? And then, of course, you have a normal microscope there and an astrolabe. And this one, anybody knows what this is? The Hubble. So this is perhaps the most successful instrument in terms of the amount of stuff that we discovered from this machine and the way it impacted the, what we think of the universe and what we think of stars and galaxies. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable, really, what he has done for us. But the point of this is that, yes, those are all spectacular and beautiful tools, and they really have amplified and magnified the way we think about the world, but they all have a range. They all have a, a precision limit, which means that small little particles will escape this guy. You know, worlds which are not very bright will escape the Hubble. And so even though we amplify reality with our tools, there is always the unknown out there. Right? There is this stuff that escapes our range, so to speak. And that is extremely important. Right? And I mentioned to you already how our worldviews change. So, for example, on the, on, the, on the edge there, I have a worldview which has the Earth in the center, which was the Aristotelian worldview that really held strong until the 1620s. Okay. It was only with Kepler and then Galileo, I would even say 1630s, that, uh, that ideas started to collapse, and then it became the sun in the center, and now we have this completely different way of thinking about the universe, which is this picture, which is, by the way, by Hubble, and I love it so much that I have a whole thing with it. This, to me, and so you can all go and see this. You go to the internet, okay? And you just type on the search, you type Hubble Gallery. That's it. And so it will take you to the NASA site where you can see the archives of every picture filtered and cleaned already that the Hubble has taken of planets, of moons of Saturn, of stars exploding, of many galaxies, nebula, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's really spectacular. And this one is called the Hubble Deep Field. Okay? So what they do is they train the telescope in the satel satellite to look at a very small patch of the sky. Okay? but for a very long time. So it's, why do you need to do that? Well, because you know, if you have something very far away, it's emitting very faint light. And so the more you look at that thing, the more you can collect that light. You know, it's sort of like a, like a sand castle. You, know? you kind of have to use a lot of sand to make the structure. It's the same idea. You're collecting these grains of light. Actually, they're called photons from very far away sources. Now you look at this picture and say, wow, that's beautiful stars, right? And it turns out that these are not stars. These are galaxies. <laughs> each one of these points of light here is a galaxy. And each one of these galaxies, some of them you can kind of see. This one is closer to us, right? It's called a spiral galaxy, if you can see this. This is very much like our own galaxy, the Milky Way. There's another one, it's called a bar galaxy, a bar spiral. And and this one is um, an elliptical uh, galaxy. And so each one of them has mi between millions and billions of stars. Okay, just think about this, just, just for a second, right? The sun is one star. And look at this spectacular solar system, right? With Mercury and Venus and Mars and Jupiter, the rings of Saturn and all the moons. That's one little star. And then you go, wow, right? And you have all these other stars. The distances between these pictures, I mean, between these objects, they range between 10 million and 100 million light years. Now let's pause for a second here. Say, what is a light year? Just give an idea, okay? 
So right now, you're seeing me a billionth of a second ago. One billionth of a second. So 0 0.08 zeros one second ago. Why? Because when light reflects on me and gets to your eyes, this travel time between me and you, your eyes, is about a billionth of a second. Now remember, light travels 186,000 miles per hour. That means that if you blink your eye, light is going to go around the Earth seven and a half times. So you blink your eye, light went around seven and a half times around the Earth, okay? So it's really fast, and we believe it's the fastest thing that exists in nature. Nothing, as far as we know, can travel faster than the speed of light. Now, if you look at the sun, please don't, unless you have proper lenses, but if you look at the sun, you're really seeing the sun as it were eight minutes ago. Because it takes eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to us. So if the sun exploded right now, you'd only find out in eight minutes. It'd be the last thing you'd know, because <laughs> it'd be the end of everything as... But the point is that information takes time to get to us. It's always traveling. So this notion that there is the present, that we are all together here in the very moment of the present, is fake. There is no present. You know, what is the present? The time, the moment that has zero duration? So how can you talk about a moment that has zero duration? Because, you know, when you say present, okay, that is already in the past, and there is the future ahead of you. So the, the brain, with this integration of the senses, fabricates this buffer, which we call now, which lasts just a few seconds, you know, and allows us to kind of order reality, in a, in a sense. But it really is something that we kind of, if you start to think about that, it's kind of mind-boggling, that you're never really in the now, you're always in the past. So when you look, when you look at the sky, you're really looking at a time machine. Because every object is in the past, the farther out an object is, the more in the past it is, in the sense that it took longer for light to travel to us. So I said eight minutes, right, for the sun. The nearest star is about four and a half light years away. So Alpha Centauri takes four and a half years for light to travel from Alpha Centauri to us. Just to give an idea of how amazing that is, if we tried right now with our fastest spaceship to go, let's go to Alpha Centauri, you know, with our fastest spaceship that travels at about 50,000 miles per hour, 50,000 miles per hour, that's super fast, right? I mean, nothing compared to 186,000 per second, but still, very fast. It would take us on our fastest spaceship 100,000 years to get to the nearest star. The, the, our neighbor, right there, okay? Just to give you an idea. So this thing of aliens traveling and coming here and building the pyramids, you know, that kind of stuff, <laughs> it's really not very probable. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I mean, and we can, if you want to know more about why, we can talk about it in the questions. Okay, now you take a step even further back, right? So we're talking about the nearest star. What about the nearest galaxy? That's Andromeda. And Andromeda is about 2 million light years away. So when somebody is looking at Andromeda with a telescope, it's seeing Andromeda 2 million years ago. When our ancestors, you know, the hominids, were kind of beginning to become bipeds in Africa, right? That's when light from that galaxy left, traveled all this time, to get here, you know, to a, a telescope, right? So it's pretty remarkable. So when you say those guys, you know, are very far away, they're very far away by hundreds of millions of light years. And now people can see objects like nascent galaxies. They're not even, they're baby galaxies. They're 10 billion light years away. So when the, the universe itself was a, time, was a baby, okay? So that shows you the power of what's going on in modern astronomy. Okay, now, uh, I don't think I want to talk about this. <laughs> Never mind. So, and I mentioned to you also this notion of matter. And I just want to finish with it um, and then tell you why 
we actually do have some spiritual hope in modern science, okay, to close off. So, I said to you that the matter that we are made of is 5%. So here it is, 5%. The other stuff, we divide into two things that we don't know what they are. One is called dark matter, it's about 27%, and the other one is called dark energy, 68%. The dark is because they don't emit light, okay? So it's sort of like this, you're gonna make a cake, you go to King Arthur Flower and, you, and you're gonna make a cake, and you know that you have to put 5% of this ingredient, and then you have to put 27% of something, and 68% of something else, but you just don't know what these things are. <laughs> it's gonna be a bad cake, right? <laughs> that is the problem with what we're doing right now. Now, people say, oh, you know, physics and cosmology, which is the part of physics that studies the universe, they are in crisis because, look, they don't know anything. These guys have been at it for almost a thousand years and they only know 5%. That's total failure, right? And the point is that we love that. And failure is extremely important in science, you know, because it's true failure that you actually learn. So that's why I always tell my grad students, you know, the ones that are suffering, doing a calculation for weeks and months and stuff, I say, you know, it's called research for a reason. Because you search and you search and you search and you search, that's the research, <laughs> until you find something useful and get a PhD, right? So, and that is very much the spirit of science, you know, is that it's true the failure of many ideas that you actually end up slowly but surely making progress, okay? Now, let me move on to what I actually was, uh, I'm gonna skip, skip life. <laughs> just a little detail, right? Um, I'm just gonna skip life because I was gonna talk a lot about asymmetry and imperfection in nature and this whole aesthetic, but that's, you know, there's a book of mine called A Tear at the Edge of Creation where I go on about why the search for the imperfect is as important, if not more important, than the search for the perfect. In, in, in science, you know, we've been very influenced by this Platonism idea, Platonic idea that nature is designed, and here you can put, you can put in what, who is your favorite designer, is designed using the principles of mathematics. So if that's true, then there is some sort of mathematical blueprint behind everything there is, and this blueprint must be geometrical, must be symmetric, it must be perfect, right? And then there's this poem by John Keats, you know, that beauty is truth, truth is beauty. And so there's this idea that beauty and perfection are related to truth, and through the years of my research, you know, I've been questioning this more and more, even though I started this way. I started looking for these theories that try to unify the, all of nature into a single big intellectual theory called the theory of ev everything, right? The toe. Um, and then I realized that that whole project is doomed to fail, okay? It can never work, okay? And it can never work for many reasons. One of them is practical. I just explained how um, instruments have a limited view of reality. A theory of everything would mean that we would know, and everything here doesn't mean, you know, I'll know who's gonna win the lottery in three months. Everything here means the behavior of the particles that make everything that exists. Okay, so we're talking about the world as a very small, not the complexities of humanity and who's gonna win the elections in 2020 and that kind of stuff. We could send American politicians to Plato's Academy to see if we get some philosopher kings out of there. It'd be kind of a great thing. But um, the point is that this description being incomplete through the way we look at the world with our instruments, you can never be sure that your theory of everything really is everything because you can't see everything. There's always something else to find out, okay? And so the whole premise is wrong and the history of science explains that as you start looking at many examples and I could go deeper into it but it's good enough for that. But the metaphor, it's this one, okay? Um, let me go back to this. So imagine that everything that we know about the world and about ourselves fits in an island. So the island grows as we know more about 
who we are, about the universe, about the forces of matter, about society, we create things. Even knowing that a new theory is wrong increases our knowledge because then you move on to something else, right? So this island is always growing. Now, every good island is surrounded by an ocean. In this case, the ocean of the unknown, what you don't know about the world. Now, here comes the paradox, which is as the island grows, the boundaries between the known and the unknown also grow. And that is why when you learn more stuff about the world, you are equipped to ask questions that before you couldn't even have contemplated, right? Just to give you a very down-to-earth example, genetic, um, genetic sequencing, right? So gene sequencing allows us to do 23andMe now, right? All these things that you can see where ancestry is. I am a extremely boring 99.9% .9 I kid you not, 99.9% .9 Ashkenazi Jew. So very boring makeup in my case. Not even a little bit of Neanderthal to kind of make spice things up. <laughs> but the point is that this, and then you can obviously find out about the potential for this or that illness, etc. You couldn't have done this. You couldn't be asking these questions about who you are, about your ancestry 20 years ago because you didn't have that technology. So the fact that you have these new advances allow you to ask questions that you couldn't before. The telescope, we use the example. The microscope is obviously a very, very obvious one, right? Before the microscope, you looked at a drop of water, you could never imagine that there were all these little living things in there, right? And then suddenly that universe of life exploded and you realize that, wow, you know, in this little drop of water, there, is, there are little creatures. So what is the limit for living things? How small can life become? That kind of question was unthinkable in the 1620s, but it became thinkable in the 1670s after the micro microscope was developed. And so it goes, right? And that is the idea of this island of knowledge. And so here, I don't have a pointer, but so here you have the unknown, right? The island is growing. Now the interesting thing about this is that also these regions here, which are the unknowables. So there are questions that you can ask about the universe, about ourselves, that just do not have an answer in the science that we know now. And it's not just because we don't know enough, it's because of the kind of science that we do, right? One of them, just to give you an example, I'll give you two examples. One of them is the origin of the universe. Contrary to what Stephen Hawking and a bunch of other people say, we have no clue how the universe appeared. We have a model called the Big Bang. That's what I work on. I'm a cosmologist. It works beautifully. We can do all sorts of things. But to take the clock all the way to time equals zero and say, we, we know how this thing worked. It's bogus. We do not know how this thing works. We cannot know how this thing works, okay? Because this is one of the oldest problems in philosophy, and if Hawking and, you know, and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Lawrence Krauss knew a little bit of philosophy, they would realize that people have been thinking about this for thousands of years. It's called the problem of the first cause, which is the idea that what is the cause that caused everything else without being caused. <laughs> and we just can't figure this out because we humans think in terms of chains of events, cause and effect, cause and effect, right? So you can retrace back your history when you're born, your ancestors, go back to Europe, whatever. Earth is emerging 4.5 billion years ago. The galaxy, the universe is emerging, and then what, right? As St. Augustine said, you know, uh, when people asked him what was God doing before he created the world, he would answer he was creating hell to put the kind of people to ask these questions. <laughs> and I love that, right? Because, you know, he was, he was upset because people would ask these things all the time. Say, so, you know, just hell, clearly, right? Um, anyways, what he did say also in last uh, tongue-in-cheek was that, when God created the world, it created time with it. So there is no sense in asking what came before because there was no before. So, okay. 
that was his way of dealing with it. The way we are dealing with it is we have no clue. So we have models, <laughs> and we use those models with more or less success, but there is no final answer. Another one is how life appeared on Earth. Even though we know a lot about the history of life on Earth now, that's another area that I work on. And we've made a lot of progress understanding the steps that went from, not necessarily from non-life to life, that one we really don't know about yet, but from early life to as life, uh, how life evolved, we know a lot. However, the point is this, if you ask how did life emerge on Earth, we cannot know. Because even if you go to the laboratory, a genius person goes to the laboratory, mixes a bunch of chemicals, they are non-living chemicals, like carbon and nitrogen, little electric sparks, you know, Frankenstein style, and creates a living thing, which would be absolutely spectacular if that ever happened, you cannot know if that is what happened here four billion years ago because life could have emerged in many, many, many different kinds of ways, right? There's no reason to believe that life only has one path to go from non-life to life. So these are very basic questions, right? And since we're talking about that, going back to the problem of, and to close, the question of the spiritual void that science, we call this thing of displacement of humanity to the edges, Copernicanism, okay? And my response to that is that you're not paying attention because if you actually look at what we have learned from modern astronomy, now for the last 20 years or so, we know not just that all these stars are out there, but that all these stars have planets, pretty much all of them, okay? Which is, as I mentioned before, remarkable. But we also looked at those planets, or at least have a sense of how big they are, how close they are to the stars. At least we have a statistical distribution of these planets. And what we are finding out is that our solar system is not very typical, first of all, and our planet is definitely not very typical. Okay? It's not just a matter of, oh, look, there is a planet close enough to a star that there is water, water is going to be in liquid state, and we need that. Life needs to be liquid because, you know, at the end of the day, we are a very complex biochemical network of reactions that need a solvent to happen. So, you know, we are basically happening. Our metabolism is just a giant, complicated network of chemical reactions. You need water for that to happen. We are about 70% of water, which is about the same coverage of water in the surface of our planet. It's kind of interesting. And, and the point is that that is not enough. Earth has many, many other properties apart from just having liquid water and the right temperature. It has a big moon. And having a big moon is extremely important because if you remember, the seasons have nothing to do with the Earth being closer or farther away from the sun. It has to do with, with the tilt of the Earth. Right? And the tilt of the Earth is, is about 23 and a half degrees. This tilt of the Earth is made stable by the mass of the moon. If we had a very tiny moon or no moon at all, the Earth would be going crazy. Okay? And we wouldn't have four seasons. The temperatures here would be completely insane. And the tides would be completely insane. And so there would be no life. The atmosphere, rich in oxygen, that was an amazing thing that happened. That was not how the atmosphere was. The atmosphere was very rich in carbon dioxide in the beginning, okay, in the first billion and a half years of, of the Earth. And then the first life form that we know of, they're called cyanobacteria or, or blue-green algae. Those things suffered a bunch of mutations and became photosynthetic. That is, through those mutations, they realized that they could use the sunlight as food, so to speak, to, to kind of process energy. And as a byproduct of this reaction, they release oxygen into the atmosphere. So over one billion years, that was the only kind of life that was around here. And those little bacteria changed the atmosphere of our planet, making it oxygen rich. 
And because of that, more complicated creatures were able to exist. So if you weren't for this, meta, uh, this change, these mutations that happen in these bacteria, there would be no oxygen in this atmosphere and we wouldn't be here. Complex life wouldn't be here. And then you have plate tectonics that regulates CO2 and you have a magnetic field that protects us from radiation coming out from outer space. So Earth is amazing as a planet. It's not just a little other planet. You go to Venus, Venus is awful. It may be beautiful to look at, you know, but it's totally like hell. It rains sulfuric acid. The temperature is about 500 degrees. It's so hot in Venus that the rocks glow. And of course, it has this runaway greenhouse effect, so you can never see the sky. So it's basically hell, like glowing rocks, sulfuric acid, you know, it's, it's basically what the image of hell is. And so when you look at that, right, and you look at our planet, and you look at the history of life in this planet, and you realize the many, many steps from those little blue-green algae to more complex organisms like sponges to the so-called Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago where all sorts of weird kinds of life appeared to the dinosaurs 250 million years ago to the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. The only reason mammals exist in abundance now is because the dinosaurs were extinct by the impact of an asteroid. So what you realize is that the only reason, we, the fact that we are here is contingent on many, 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 many things that have happened. The history of life in a planet is a mirror of the life's history of that planet. Okay, you change one thing and everything else. Changes. So if this asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico 65 million years ago had not hit, and the dinosaurs would not be extinct, we wouldn't be here. So all this contingency, and then here we are, we humans, and we are the only species, okay, dogs are super smart, my dog is a genius, you know, and dolphins and crows can count to four, okay, but they don't build radio telescopes and write poetry, right, and cook wonderful things, so it's a different kind of intelligence we're talking about. So what we realize now in the 21st century is that the Earth is a very rare planet, that life is very rare out there. Just look. I mean, Mars, not looking good. Certainly, definitely, not any other planet or moon will not have, I would imagine, any kind of life, okay? So the point is life is rare, this planet is rare, and we as a species, we are very rare. So when people ask, what about life in other planets? <coughs> sure, there are so many worlds, I said trillions of worlds, right? So there is, and the laws of chemistry and the laws of physics are the same across the universe. So odds are that yes, when you look around, there'll be Earth-like planets that may have some kind of life there. But odds also are that that kind of life is going to be very simple, like the bacteria that dominated life in this planet for three billion years. Think about this. Life has ex existed here for three and a half billion years. For three billion of those years, it was just one cell organism, okay? So odds are, yes, if there is life, it's gonna be simple. And even if it's complex, just like the dinosaurs, very complex life form, as far as we know, they were very smart, right? So the fact that life can become complex does not mean that life can become intelligent. The theory of evolution says nothing about the fancy word is teleology, that there is a direction or a directive for life to become complex and hence intelligent at the end. What does happen is that life likes to be well adapted. So as long as species are well adapted to their environment, they're in good shape intelligent or not. Clearly intelligence is a plus, or maybe a minus, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> but the point is, there is no such thing as if you wait long enough, life in another planet is gonna become intelligent. So full circle back to us, we look at this planet, we look at life here, and we look at us 
the only species we know who is self-aware, that knows the importance of life and the importance of this planet. And that puts us in the moral center of the universe again. Not the geometric center, but the moral center. Because as far as we know, we now have the duty to protect this precious thing that we have, which is this planet and life in it. And I call this human centrism. And I think that once you look at it this way, it's something that unifies the world because it looks as us, doesn't matter what color skin you have, what you believe in, what political party you're following, you are part of the human species in this planet. And because of that, you are rare and you are precious and you have a moral duty to make sure that we live, we, we live the world, leave the world better for Una's generation there. I mean, if we don't do that, what are we doing here, right? That to me is the way we go back full circle to the center of the universe and understand the importance of being human with the light of modern science. All right, thanks. Okay, folks, so I talk too much, as I always do, but if you have some questions, and I see that the Norwich Bookstore brought some of the books. That's very nice, thank you. I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with that. Um, I wanted to show you, so these are three of the books that I touched on today, okay, that I've written. Anyways. Um, so please, if you have any questions, don't be shy. And I see a hand on the back, please, go ahead. Just speak very loud so we can all hear you. So consciousness, okay, so consciousness is the hardest problem that exists, essentially. Um, and some people say it's another unknowable to actually figure out how neurons and their synapses create you. And how come you are you? I mean, essentially, we all have the same stuff, right? We have our neurons, we have our synapses, but we are certainly different from one another. And not just we're different from one another, but you're going to be pretty much the same tomorrow, we hope, right? Um, and, and there is this continuity as well, this sort of coherence, right? How do neurons and synapses orchestrate who you are is a big mystery, right? <clears throat> um, so there is something called the hard problem of consciousness, which is the idea that even if you use science to, you know, you know, nowadays, if you go to the cognitive and brain sciences department at Dartmouth, the big thing to do is use an fMRI to kind of make maps of your brain as things are going on. So, for example, if you hear Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, okay, some parts of your brain are going to light up. And then if they take off the sound and say, okay, now, Imagine, you know, here in your head, you know, Beethoven's fifth, the same parts are going to light up. So clearly there is a correlation between what you're uh, sensing and the activities in your brain. However, and this is okay and this can be studied, however, the subjective feeling of listening to that is something that we cannot capture with mappings of neurons, okay? So essentially the hard problem of consciousness is can you even make sense of what is subjectivity by studying neurons and their connections? Or is there something else going on that we don't even know what it is? And depending who you talk to, this we don't know what it is can become very, very wild very quickly, you know? Um, like there's a cosmic consciousness and we are just part of that cosmic consciousness. Somehow we're kind of like, sort of like radios with antennas, you know? And we're sort of, kind of, if you have the right frequency, you tune into that, and you're part of this big 
cosmic intelligence. Um, some people call this uh, pantheism um, in a new version of pantheism. Or it's a cosmic version of pantheism, right? So intelligence is in the universe. Others say that it's just a matter of time. You know, the more we know about the brain, the more we're going to figure these things out, right? And the people that don't believe that, and I honestly, I'm sort of on the fence. I actually kind of sympathize with the hard problem of consciousness. People, they're called the Mysterians. The reason they're called the Mysterians is because there's a mystery of who you are that cannot be grasped. So if you look at the color red, your subjective feeling of the color red is going to be different from the subjective feeling of somebody, somebody else. Okay, and we cannot capture that with maps of the brain and stuff like that, at least not yet. So, so that's the idea. Now, consciousness, of course, is a property that emerges. Other animals have different levels of consciousness, right? So I would say more, um, I mean, <laughs> depending again who you talk to in cognitive neurosciences, they would say even a thermostat has a level of consciousness. You know? So there's this guy who is a very serious guy, uh, his last name is Tononi, he's a professor in Wisconsin. So he actually created a measure of consciousness that starts with the most basic, a response to a stimulus, which is like a thermostat, right? Hey, I set it for 65 degrees. If it goes below that, it kicks up. So it's responding to an external stimulus. To, of course, this very complex thing called the human mind, right? Um, I don't know how to react to that. I, I don't think a thermostat has any kind of consciousness. I think that's a misuse of the term. But the point is, the mystery remains, right? And furthermore, you, I think you said buzzwords like quantum and connection between. And, and there, you know, that could be a whole other talk, honestly. Maybe next year I can talk about quantum reality and, and consciousness. I'll be happy to. Uh, but, but the idea is that when you start looking Okay, when you look at this, you have a very clear sense of who you are and who the other things, what or who the other things are in this room. You can detach yourself as an observer and you have this God's eye view of what's going on in a sense, a wrong term, but the fact that you, the observer and the observed can be separated very clearly. When you start looking at the world of the very small, that doesn't happen anymore. When you look at an atom, you can't distinguish, you can't separate yourself from the atom and say, oh, there is the atom over there. Because before you look at the atom, you cannot even say the atom exists. So it turns out that the very act of looking at a small object like an atom, in a very metaphorical way, gives it existence. Okay. Um, and that is mind-boggling strange. Right? Because you can start extrapolating, you can say, wait a second, does that mean that the world does not exist unless I interact with it? Right? And anyways, here we go. So those are the issues that, that come by. And to be honest with you, there is no resolution. Some people say that quantum physics does play a role in consciousness. Like Roger Penrose, for example, said that. Um, it doesn't look like it does in a sense that he was talking about. Other experiments seem to have ruled out his ideas. On the other hand, you know, when a, a, a neurochemical goes through a synapse, it has to go through what's called a synaptic gate, which is a very small object, and that's a molecule. So there are quantum effects when the molecule flows through the synaptic gate that are, call, are called diffraction. So maybe at the very, very core of the brain function, and there are quantum effects, but I'm not sure that's going to help us understand consciousness. No, I think consciousness, for lack of a better word, is um, some sort of emergent phenomena that we're still very far from understanding. Yes? Sorry. It's you. Uh, when you deal with the concept of self-consciousness, you are mixing, at least as I hear, uh, scientific analysis without considering, at least as I've heard, 
The 1907 lecture of Husserl on the topic of self-consciousness, the uh, development in early Heidegger of the theory of Dasein. Nice, great, right. yes. Uh, the response with regard to the, uh, your conclusion as to the meaning of man seems to be an extrapolation of Teilhard. And the, the crisis, as it were, of bringing together self-consciousness with me, you have Camus, you have Sartre, you have a whole analysis, yes. which brings us back to your conclusion yes. that the meaning is not necessarily in either ultimate knowledge or comprehensive theory but in the capacity of the question. Yes. So, so it doesn't seem to me that you've addressed the issue of self which is the real core yes. of the problem. Right. No, I'm, I'm, I, I, I actually, uh, I love what you just said. In fact, I wrote an essay about exactly this called The Blind Spot. And you can look, it's in a magazine called Aeon. And we're writing a book, me and two other colleagues, about precisely this issue, which is the fact that experience is irreducible. Okay? And it is very much inspired by Husserl and by, by what Heidegger had to say about the centrality of the human experience in anything that we do. So everything, everything that we do depends on how we interact with reality. And by, and by how we understand who we are as we look at the world. Uh, my question, therefore, focuses okay. on whether or not the advent of death in the current world, in terms of medicine, and the development of AI uh, will be able to open perspective beyond the range of human experience and yeah. therefore reveal patterns and methods of knowledge which may take us one step beyond Einstein's limitations. Right. So did you so okay. So this is another talk completely, but let me very quickly address that. It turns out that Last Tuesday, I was at the Museum of Science in Boston mediating a conversation precisely on this issue that is artificial intelligence, transhumanism, and the future of life and death. Okay. So I'm very, very interested in that topic, of course. And, um, and the answer there, you know, there are some people that, and this is very much like the Frankenstein story all over again, right? So... When Mary Shelley wrote the Franken Frankenstein in 1818, she was using the cutting edge science of the time, which was the discovery by Volta and Galvani that um, electric currents made muscles twitch. You know, and so if that's true, then motion has something to do with electricity in the body. And hence, if I have a death, a dead creature, and I put a lot of electricity in it, that that creature can come back to life. And hence, the secret of death is really just electricity. And so she wrote that book as a cautionary tale, saying that be very careful what you're doing, because you know, if you remember, the, the, the subtitle of the book is Modern Promet Prometheus, you know, who was punished before stealing the fires of, of the gods and giving it to people, right? So the modern Prometheus here would be the scientist stealing the secret of death from God and giving it to people. Okay, 200 years later, we have a reincarnation, in a sense, of this with the new science now, which is the notion that, in principle, if we live in the age of information, in principle, very, very much in principle, all we are is encoded information, and you could decipher that. You could kind of unravel the amount of information you have in an in a, in a animal, in a human, and code that as a program and load it up into an artificial machine, a computer of some kind that we obviously don't have, 
and hence your essence, so goes the myth, could become you without a body, and hence you could live forever, as long as you back up. Don't forget to back up. <laughs> Got to back up, otherwise it could be trouble. But we are so far away, sir, from, from anything that close. But this is the current myth, and there are some very smart people that believe in this sort of stuff. Okay, there is a, I don't know if you know this book, but if you don't, you would love it. It's called To Be a Machine by Mark O'Connell. It is a phenomenal book about transhu transhumanism. And I could go on forever because I'm very interested in this topic, but I, I see where you're going. Yes, people are discussing this very intensely. Una, did you have a question? Okay. How the universe was created? My theory? Oh, oh boy. Um, sure, I have a theory, but what I've been working on lately is that the universe um, has existed forever, and what it does is it alternates cycles in which it's expanding, growing like it is now, and then it reaches a maximum size, and then it collapses, and it reaches something called a bounce, which is a small size, sort of like you're squeezing it, and then it goes out again and in again. So that's called bounce cosmology, because it's bouncing. And it's very preliminary and very artificial right now, but it's a fun thing to think about, that perhaps the problem is not solved by understanding the moment of creation, but by saying that there is no specific moment of creation, but, but many, many moments in which the universe appears and disappears and appears and disappears. Um, this is not a new idea. You know, this was, well, first of all, it was part of Hindu mythology with the, with the Shiva, right? The dance of the Shiva is exactly that. Shiva creates and destroys the world, and that's why my first book is called The Dancing Universe, precisely because of this, uh, this idea. But in 20th century cosmology, this came back. And in 21st century cosmology, it's back again with this notion of the bounce. So I'm not, I would not put my money on it. So it's not something I'm devoutly um, a believer in this. But it's an interesting way of thinking about this issue. There's no first cause. There are just infinitely many causes. And then you can ask, but how come the universe appear in the first place? And I would say, I have no idea. <laughs> That's for you. That will, that'll be your problem in 20 years. Um, one more. Let's uh, have Jenna balance here. There is that lady has been asked. Yes. Yes. Thank you for talking. Congratulations. And you have a very effective PR machine at the middle school. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, I was wondering, just as a gardener, and I see all this buckthorn and garlic mustard coming up, you know, invasive, invasive, invasive. And then I think about sustainability and, you know, how we can sustain a certain amount of population and the population is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm sure this has been thought of before, but I just can't help but always come back to, are we an invasive species on this planet? Oh, boy, of course we are. We are invasive and parasitic. There is no question about it. And, uh, and um, so, <laughs> and what are we going to do about it? That's to me the real question. You know, be, huh? From this planet? Oh, you're talking about invading from another planet? Oh, I misunderstood you. Oh, I thought you meant invasive in the sense that we appeared, you know, in the in the central plains of Africa and spread out like. Oh, okay. So that is a big question mark, but uh, there is a theory called panspermia. And panspermia is the notion that, that little spores of life fluctuate about the universe and fall into different planets, and if they find the right conditions, they may germinate and become life, right? Um, we have zero evidence for this. You know, I mean, there is no evidence for this whatsoever. Everything, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting idea. Uh, people, very serious people have made experiments. Is it possible for one of those spores to travel on an asteroid and, you know, take a hike on an asteroid and basically fall here 
and survive the entry into the atmosphere because it gets very hot. And the answer is if the, if the, if the spore is sufficiently uh, is protected from the surface, if it's in the core or close to the core, then yes. But honestly, um, I think it's more plausible, and here we are talking about stuff we do not know, okay, so it's speculation, that the process has happened here. You know, not people for sure, but I'm talking about original life. Yeah. Was that it? So we do one last? Okay. I see a head point. Okay, it's a you. Okay, ma'am. Okay, you have the last question, so it better be very good. good. Yes, there is no way science can prove or disprove God. And it's just not even part of the conversation. You know, there is, so remember one very important thing, which is science is very good about things we can see and measure, right? And so it's very good about, oh, I can see this and hence this exists. It's not very good at ruling out what cannot exist. Okay, so... And people say, what about fairies and gnomes and all that stuff? You know, people, you know, oh, Bertrand Russell had the famous argument of the teapot. You know the argument of the teapot? The argument of the teapot was the following, is that I say there is a teapot in orbit around the sun. And, and you say, how do you know? I said, I know, you know, but in order to prove that, you have to go around the sun looking for a tiny teapot. How the heck are you going to find a teapot to go around the sun? The space is big, right? So the point is that there's only so much you can see of the world. And, and I got some heat because when I got this, this prize, you know, one of the things that the journalists love to talk to me about is about atheism and agnosticism and this God, you know, for obvious reasons, right? And I always place myself as an agnostic, not as an atheist. And then I gave the radical atheists a hard time, the radical atheists, because atheism, you know, has many shades of gray, right? I mean, there is very radical atheism like Richard Dawkins, and there is much less radical, which is really what I would call agnosticism. Um, so what they do is, to me, also inconsistent because they basically deny the existence of God based on faith. They say, I, I believe that God doesn't exist. <laughs> right? I mean, how do you know? I'm sure. How are you sure? I see no evidence. That's not proof of anything. Right? As Carl Sagan used to say, right, that uh, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So the fact that you don't see, right, doesn't mean it's not there, you just don't see it. So that's why when you, and, and so when I said that, and of, of course the journalists loved that, atheists were infuriated with me because they said, how could you possibly say something like this? I'm like, I'm not talking about all shades of atheism. If you have the humility to accept the fact that you don't know everything and have the open, -minded, open mind to be surprised, then you're agnostic. They're not an atheist, at least not in the traditional sense of the word, right? But it's just semantics in the point. But, the, but to answer your question is, I may not be a believer, but I cannot rule things out. So That's, it's a matter of faith. Hmm? It's a matter of faith? Yeah, exactly. And, and another point, just to complete this, what people tend to, because of this animosity between science and religion, people used to say, oh, God is where... We don't see or understand stuff. Okay, so for example, in the times of Newton, he didn't know why the moon went around the earth. How come the initial push 
or why the planets are going around the sun. So he actually said God and the angels, Newton, Isaac Newton. We never studied this in school, but he did. You just have to read his book. God and the angels gave the push. Okay, so solve the problem using a supernatural force. The point being that that is called the God of the gaps. Meaning, what you don't know about reality, you put attribute to God. That is a horrible way of betting for your faith. Because science advances, you know more, and the gap gets smaller and smaller if that's how you're going to think about it. And God, you know, God gets humiliated. So if you're going to believe in God, do not put its existence in what we don't know of the world. Put its existence in the way you believe in God and your faith. And that's why William James, you know, in the variety of, of, of uh, religious experience, which is a phenomenal book, would say that the true nature of religion is deeply subjective. There is a relationship that you alone have with the mystery of existence. And sometimes you're able to channel your mind and figure and, and sense that. And that's a deep re religious experience and that is independent of what kind of organized religion you subscribe to. So that subjective nature of faith, it's yours to keep. Enjoy it. All right. Thank you.